Greetings and salutation to all you folks out there. So today I've got a sentence cast for you, and this, I previewed about the first 10 minutes of it, and this is seriously one of the most crazy starts to sentence I've ever seen. So I am just going to go ahead and cast this one with no qualms about it, but it is probably going to settle in to be a long game. So sit down, get your drinks, get everything together you need, and let's have a good steady cast. But... Uh, there are a couple things I need to say first. Number one, any of you guys that are supporting me on Patreon at the five or fifteen dollar tiers, remember that you have that um, the reward ready for you if you want me to do a video on one of your games, doing basically a tutorial slash coaching cast. Um, there were a couple of guys who already sent me one, and I have to apologize. I actually rebuilt my computer over the weekend. And it seems that in rearranging slash cloning my drives and getting all of this other stuff set up, I do not actually have those messages anymore. I had saved them like to a notepad thing and they're gone. So I'm sorry about that. If you sent me a message with that replay in it, please resend it to me either at the Gmail email account, which is in the description of this video or on the Patreon page. And I will get those out as quickly as I possibly can. To everybody else out there, don't forget that I've got the Facebook page and the email down there. Send me any replays you've got. I've actually gotten a lot of replays over the last few days. I've watched quite a few of them. Not all of them are cast worthy, and I'm sorry to guys that sent me in and I just sent them in to me. I just can't do it, but um, I did get a kick. There were a couple of really hilarious games in there, and I always get a good time out of watching y'all's games. Not all of them are castable, though, so just bear that in mind. I have seen them, and I'm not totally just throwing away the replays. I am watching them. So let's dive into this game, introduce the teams, and see where it takes us. Um, on the northern side, we have Twitek. He is taking Seraphim in the beach slot. Then we've got Newbie, who I don't think is actually a newbie. He's a 1200 rank. This is an average Joe's game, by the way. Uh, 1000 through 1500. He's taking Aeon in the air slot, which is pretty much the norm. And we've got Granky taking UEF on the rock and Cybern in the front for Itar, Eider, whatever. I'm not sure exactly how I'm supposed to pronounce that. So all four factions present on the north side. Then we've got Meaty Owl Legs taking Seraphim Air on the south. Seraphim for Karisi, Karisi, something like that, on the beach. And then Cybern, the faction of choice for Eklart. And then UEF for Ghostronin. So there is no Aeon on the southern team. Double Sarah, Cybern, and UEF. So it looks like these slots are pretty well balanced out. 1,000 on the front, 15 versus 14. We got 12 versus 12, and 13 on 12. So just about as close to 100% balance as you can get if the rankings are actually telling the truth. So as we all know, startup on Settings is a fairly involved build, so there's gonna be basically nothing happening except on the front. And we're gonna have a rush for all of this mass. There's about uh, 12 or 14,000 mass, I think. I think it's 12,000 in the front slot, and it's mainly in the T3 Rex. Yes, I know there's some T2 Rex, but because of the changes to the reclaim values, there actually is not a ton of mass in these three Rex. So it's actually more efficient to stop here-ish and snag the Salem and these Rex and then walk this away as opposed to walking across the Salems and grabbing all of them. On the beach slot, we already have an air factory going down for Karisi as well as for Twitek. Now it's not the quickest air factory ever. We're at three minutes and they're throwing those down, but you do want to get them down quickly when you're on the beach slot because this is your main objective. You want to get here and at minimum deny it, if not actually supply it with a couple of engineers and a factory. Um, we see we've already got a transport headed down there and that was gotten due to a vicious power spam and a lot of reclaim. You can see there's a huge chunk of trees missing. Those clumps of trees have about 100 power in them each. So if you send out this attack move order from the factory, your engineers will park and reclaim a pretty wide area of tree clumps. And that can boost you up to getting that early air without actually having to build all the power generators necessary. It increases your or decreases your transport time by a couple of minutes in a lot of cases. You can see Ghost Ronin has done exactly the same thing here on even fewer 
power generators. Granted, he did have the hydro a little bit earlier, but the principle holds true. So we got some air coming out now for the beaches. Yes. It looks like Twitek is slightly slower. So Eklart, Erklart, whatever. I, I, you all know I fail. I completely butcher foreign name pronunciations. I am sure. I cannot remember what uh, language it was. Someone messaged me on YouTube that, uh, or they left a comment on a video that they were just dying laughing over my pronunciation of a name. Well, I am essentially a foreigner, so please don't blame me. Beautiful mech drop here. We've got two mech marines, which were carried to the island in the event that there was actually something there that needed killed. But since his opponent had not yet arrived, he carted those right over here to the expansion, killed off the engineer, and it looks like he's going to peg all three of those mass extractors before anybody can do anything about it. So that is a beautiful strategy, not only going to ensure the claiming of the island, but also stall his opponent. Now, Twitek's actually doing pretty well for himself. He is behind in mass already, though, and these slots are going to change up very, very quickly in the early game. We do have a transport up for Carisi. However, the island is pretty well locked down. we got a land factory. We've got four engineers. Everything is A-OK -okay for Granky. The green cranky person. I keep getting a mental image of the Grinch. So Cybern versus Cybern Front. This means we're going to see a lot of Manta spam exchange. And these guys are already setting up a lot of factories. We've got four and a fifth going down on the north side. And we've got two on the south side. Ah, there we go. I was about to say there's too much spam for only two factories. But there's the other two right there already cranking out some engineers and tanks. Drop is headed out for Carisi, but I don't think that's going to do any good. It is only engineers. There's already more engineers than that on the island, and there is a artillery, is an artillery, sitting out the open already. This bomber is coming in, though. It is going to easily pick off the naval engineer and going to happily wander about the meadows of the beach position casually picking off engineers as it goes until it gets brutally slaughtered by a gang of interceptors. Such a sad thing to see. It was a sunny day on Settons, and alas, the brutality has found it. Okay. Frigate heading over. I was about to say that that's going to be a possible naval denial, but we already have two factories down on the island. It's actually a good idea to build out here. Um... You already have the engineers out next to the water. You can throw down those T1 factories and start pumping out some frigates while you go ahead and get engineers online in some factories on the land. Not a bad situation if I do say so myself. Or you can take the more aggressive approach and actually lay down four. Now this is kind of hilarious. Apparently that transport dropped its three engineers as it was dying. And those engineers are imme immediately going to become as big a pain in the butt as they possibly can, throwing down <laughs> torpedo launchers within firing range of the factories. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Anytime you can get a little bit of hilarity and a lot of carnage, that is awesome. On the north side, we have a drop that is going to be six and uh, six artillery pieces. That would be Lobos. I'm going to drop all the way back in the air player's base, the cheeky bastards. And then Ghostronin is doing his absolute level best to be aggressive as possible, hurling hordes of bombers up towards the front player. Now these guys, if they can get a move on... Ah, that's what I was afraid of. Beautiful overcharge. Unfortunately, that was a T2 mass extractor kill. The high alpha damage on those artillery shots, like once there's a full volley of shots in the air, a lot of things are going to die. Frigates coming online, I think we're going to see a couple frigate deaths. Frigates have a lot of firepower and a lot of HP to burn through. They're easily going to slaughter all of those engineers, but in return, going to lose one frigate and possibly another, maybe... A little bit of damage was done that day, but not enough to really make a difference in the outcome of the game. We're about to see our first large land collision. We have T2 online for Urklart. 
and he is looking like he's on top of things actually. Both the ACUs are at half health, neither one of these guys has the gun upgrade, and Itzer looks like he's in a bit of trouble actually. He pushed all of his mantis behind him, why? Getting down below 2,000 health, he's finally going to collide, but these T2 tanks are being a booger to kill. Those things pack in a lot of firepower. He needs to land an overcharge on that. Please overcharge, please overcharge. 400 health and beautiful triple overcharge. Not quite enough for, well, actually, I think he had that veterancy before. Not quite enough for another level of veterancy, but he has close 116 health. Thankfully, he has his own air cover and he is going to be able to fall back. Dang, that was close. And he's tripping himself up with his own units. Another overcharge, he finally hit the veterancy 2k health and he is good to go. And while we've been focused on that, T2 artillery drops, the bane of everyone's existence who is not Seraphim. The Zooey drop, one of the most dreaded things on this map. I freaking hate it. When I don't have enough air cover, and these little guys get all up in my base. They pack a wallop. High fire rate, high DPS, good spread, and they move fairly quickly on water even. They are one of the two T1 hover units. There was a lot of discussion a while back as to whether or not these were actually overpowered. I do not believe they are because they cost 50% more than any of the other T1 artillery. You're gonna spend a lot more building these artillery than you do with any other faction. And that amount of damage was needed to keep Twitek in the game. He is being invaded by frigates and he does have some air coverage. Thankfully, it looks like his air player does have enough ASF online to guard those torpedo bombers and he's going to be able to defend his shores with them. He's trying to lay down some T1 naval factories in the top corner, but those were scouted, unfortunately, by Medial Legs. So we've got a little squad of naval units headed up towards the north side, trying to knock those out before they come a, become a problem. As soon as all of the mech marines start heading back down towards the south, we have another drop coming in. Got T2 gunships coming out from the air player. Those are going to be of assistance moving around the map a little quicker and knocking those artillery pieces out. Uh, well, they don't have to because the ASF snagged that drop. So, I think we're finally going to see an end to the drops. We have ASF, we have scouts. Yeah, pretty good situation at the moment. I think these guys will be fine mopping up the last of those artillery on the southern end. Total damage. We had four, five, six seven mass extractors lost all of them t2 eight that was actually pretty bad eight t2 mass extractors knocked out down to 70 income as opposed to 102 and he has got a lot of rebuilding to do thankfully he has more total mass extractors to draw from which will allow him to recover faster so basically twitech needs to shoot for uh, getting his T2 Navy online ASAP and then rushing over to Ghost Stronin's naval production before he can get T3 Navy online or for that matter even T2 in any significant number. The Seraphim T2 Navy absolutely demolishes, obliterates UEF or for that matter most other factions T2 Navy hands down. Uh, all you need is a little bit of careful micro and you are A-OK. -okay. Um, the only problem is if you wait too long, Seraphim T3 Navy is so weak that it gets a little bit difficult. The battleships are not bad. The T3 subs are pretty terrible in the current balance. Honestly, you don't want to build them. It is better to borrow an engineer from someone else and either build UEF battleships or just go for massive T2 destroyer swarms and try to micro them in small groups to make them as effective as possible. So, yeah, it's not a real good situation for Seraphim late game Navy. All these frigates are heading up towards the north. They have successfully cleared the naval production up there, and that means they are now homed in on this little factory right here. There's a nice little piece of reclaim out front for Twitek to pick up. He needs to get that production online quickly, though, because he has about a dozen frigates headed his way. 
along with a couple of T1 subs, and that is a substantial amount of firepower, enough that if he's not prepared for it, he will lose all his build power and possibly get his navy denied yet again. On the southern navy, we have a nice little engagement with a roughly equal number of frigates and T1 subs. Nothing really fantastic is going to happen here, but we have two destroyers bringing up the rear, and once those guys get in range, it's going to be game over for those frigates. Got to kite with them, though. Get in range and the frigates will kill your destroyers. Just got to get right outside of that range. Kite him in nicely and eliminate those boats. On the front, we're seeing T1 spam versus T2. There's a little bit of T1 still streaming in from Urklart, but the majority of these are going to be rhinos and vipers. So if Itter does not tech up pretty quickly he may actually be in a bad spot because eventually this massive T1 spam is going to lose to the T2 and I think we're pretty close to that tipping point. At this exact moment, it looks like Meaty Owlleg does have more ASF, but Newbie has a higher eco, which means that if Meaty Owlleg's does not take advantage of air superiority now, Later in the game, Newbie is going to outstrip his production so far that he will not be able to recover, barring a miracle such as <laughs> the other air player flying over a bunch of Sams. And I've seen it happen. I know everybody has, uh, but it is not something that you should take for granted. Frigates coming in and very properly targeting all of the build power as a priority. Yeah, I know you've got the T2 torpedo launcher chewing away at your fleet, but you really need to kill off the build power to prevent further problems and then focus fire on the offensive options because those are typically pretty easy to knock out if you have a large swarm of frigates. There we go. Torpedo defense is going down and that production is going to be stalled. The problem, ah, there we go. A cruiser's coming in. That's going to provide both air support and, and the ability to lock this factory down with a stream of TAC missiles. Meteow Legs used to have more ASF, but he had his ASF split into two groups. Newbie had fewer total, but since he was able to engage one group and then the other, he actually caught up with and surpassed the number of ASF in the air that Owl Legs has. And from this point on, I think it's going to be a bit of a loss for Meteow Legs net because we're going to see production go up and up and up for Newbie and Menial is not quite going to be able to match that, I don't think. We've got destroyers moving in to Granky's base now. That is going to be a hard loss for Navy, I think. We've got Hover. We've got the destroyers moving in. Carisi is pulling 105 Eco, and let's see, that is Granky pulling 248. What we have here is a classic over Eco. Um, the eco was placed in too high of an importance and basically there was not enough build power slash not enough naval production to actually deny the inferior eco but superior production of Carisi. And this becomes a huge problem because once Carisi actually locks down the navy, he will be able to reclaim all of this, potentially take the island, and be able to keep... Granky out of the water while he ecos up and then we have well Granky technically has the uphill position but he has the uphill battle versus an established navy which is a very very difficult thing to pull against this was shaping up to be a beautiful incursion by these T2 units but it was pretty much stomped on by that strap bomber eliminating several at a time on those groups I think it got two passes. I was kind of watching out of the corner of my eye. Um, reasonably good denial of that push. That's going to give... The names in this are killing me. Eider. I'm just going to call him Eider. It's going to give Eider some time to get his production online and get things like he needs them to be. And it does look like with his superior eco, he will be able to outmatch Urklart from this point on. So we're seeing the cruisers come out. They are going to be able to kill off that factory. We have a single half health destroyer. Actually, more like two-thirds health. Um, if those cruisers are able to stay in range and lock these factories, that's pretty much going to be GG for Twitex Navy. 
but as it is, it looks like Ghost Ronin is prioritizing the front player, hoping to eliminate some of these mass extractors, and it looks like he's going to be pretty dang successful at it. Some gunships moving in. It's going to help, but not solve the problems, as the destroyers are able to take a dip and use their torpedo damage versus the factories instead of having to use their surface cannons. It does things a little bit slower, but the gunships can't hit, so overall it's a net win. T2 tanks moving in, going to kill off a lot of the build power back here. Going to sit on the wrong side of the factory and pretty much waste their DPS on those factories. It definitely put a damper on the party, but it is not over quite yet. Strap Bombers moving in from Newbie, and this is where we need to see the air superiority start coming into play. I like Restores, but maybe a bad choice since we already have established cruiser formations in the North Navy, and we've got a second cruiser out in the South. Of course, Seraphim Cruisers, with their beautiful flat cannons, are going to be able to deal with Restores very, very well. Gunships are a bad choice versus Seraphim Navy. You should definitely go for the Tort Bombers at every possible instance. And it does look like we have a Solus rolling out. It's probably a good indicator of things to come. Yes, there is another one on the production line. Three cruisers right now in the South Navy. And this is about the best thing that you can hope for. You want to use these cruisers to hamper the front player in every way possible. And right now, I don't think that's actually T1 point defense. That is, yes, power generator. Good choice of targets. You need to pick that one off and then start on some of these mass extractors. There's a T3 right there. Unfortunately, there's TMD coming online. The cruisers are going to be able to overwhelm it for just a little while longer. Mmm. That's a shame. Soul is dying before it kills really much of anything useful. One cruiser. Um, these UEF cruisers are specifically designed to overwhelm TMD. They have a close firing pattern of three missiles with a large gap in between. So the three missiles close together are already hard for a TMD to deal with. And then each missile has two health. So if they're all firing uniformly in formation like this, you can actually power your way through a large amount of TMD and uh, do a pretty good bit of damage. The Seraphim cruisers, on the other hand, fire a continuous stream of one health missiles. So one TMD almost counters one Seraphim cruiser. Uh, if you have a TMD under the front side of a T2 shield, then you can infinitely stop one cruiser because in the time it takes for the TMD to lose that one tack missile that it can't stop, the shield actually regens about the same amount of health. So I think it's like maybe every eighth or ninth missile hits the shield and uh, the regen in between is plenty to make that up. Got two T3 subs online. In the North Navy, that is Twitech putting those things away. Um, this is why T3 subs in the current balance kind of suck, and you need to move that destroyer before it dies needlessly to tack missile fire. Um, these subs have gotten knocked down to 4,000 health, which means that one Solus kills them in one pass. And it also decreases the amount of T2 bombers that you have to field to kill the things. So that causes a bit of an issue. Um, they're very, very paper. Additionally, they were, I, in this last balance, I think they were slowed down just a hair. Or maybe it was their range that was decreased. One way or the other, they reduced the kiting capabilities. And the range is literally the only strength of the T3 sub. You can effectively counter them with T2 sub hunters and kind of sort of with Vespers, but really, realistically speaking, the T2 destroyer for Aeon is better for torpedoes. Um, they're fairly easy to stop with a solid torpedo defense on your faction, and then if you have the stealth subs, you can actually attack without being hit. So these guys get overwhelmed pretty easily. I love the Solus passes. Hopefully he uses the attack split order. 
It looks like no. He only attacked two targets, one on a frigate and a whole bunch of torpedoes wasted on a destroyer that was dead anyway. So that is uh, case in point why you really, 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 really need to use that shift G and pick as many targets as you can. That was all of the Solus's lost for like four naval units killed. And that was a total air loss attempting to defend them. So Mini Aleg pulling off a bit of good micro on that. And he is going to pick up a complete and total air domination. Which means that Newbie needs to start building SAMs or something to defend his team with. We're going to see a shift to strap bombers and torps, I imagine, from this side. Back to the North Navy. We have battle cruisers moving into position. These outrange, out DPS, the Seraphim destroyers. And with the help of those bulwarks, they're going to do a pretty dang good job. The only problem is, ah, there we go, two Coopers coming up. There are no Coopers, and there's no AoE damage because there's no battleship. So this is going to be very, very weak versus these subs. Once we get some Coopers in here, it's going to be a totally different story. The Coopers are going to be able to completely and totally negate the Torp damage of these subs. You basically need two Coopers to one sub. So for this exact scenario, he would need 8 to 10 Coopers under his shield, and he would be completely and totally fine, but he just doesn't have them. So instead, he's going to have to run, and he's going to take heavy damage along the way. Basically, every faction has a good counter to the T3 sub, and the T3 sub in its weakened state is not a substitute for the lack of support vessels in the Seraphim Navy. Basically, you got to rely on good micro with your T2 destroyers and your T3 subs to kite for as long as you possibly can. You need to build mobile shields uh, to send out over the water because they do hover. And you're going to want to build some battleships to use the ground fire on those. Nice little engine drop down here. we got T2 engineers online. There are T1 artillery building here, though, which is kind of unfortunate. I think they will actually win versus those T2 engines. Unless they can get a T1 point defense online with a T2 behind it, which I kind of doubt. I think this island is going to stay in the control of Granky. And it looks like we do have a Atlantis online and Atlantis. I keep misusing my articles. Um, this is going to be a very, very good anti-air platform. <clears throat> you can see on that, going to pretty easily snag that T3 scout. Oh, no, it is going to get past. It's, yeah. Projectiles are going to time out right before they hit. So, spy plane is through. But, this has a very small AoE, if I'm not totally mistaken, and pretty dang good DPS. Of course, for how much mass that unit costs, it's not really worth it, but it is a good anti-air platform to have around. Um, if you're threatened by air and you can come up from the water with this thing, not have to keep it submerged to avoid naval threats. The Atlantis is pretty much the only mass efficient T4. Like, if you build an Atlantis, stick a bulwark over it and three or four Coopers, it is actually a dang good counter to T3 subs. Um, it does very, very well for itself. T3 subs doing one of their best multitasking feats. They are shredding apart this group of ASF. Hopefully they can pull back out of range. Not a whole lot actually lost, but a lot of them damaged. So that was a very nice use of unit abilities. Pull those suckers back and need to get them back under the water. There they go. Twitek is using his micro well. Battlecruiser and, in fact, the entire formation of the UAF Navy is headed over to the left to try to help out with this break in the neck. We've got some Loyalists, so T3 land is online, but they're facing up versus Bricks and Cerberus turrets in the back, so not going to be able to make much progress here. Battlecruiser is going to move up in the back here and should be able to lay down some cover fire, if not for the terrain. Beautiful, beautiful terrain, the one disadvantage of beam weapons. They are fearsome and awesome and amazing versus Navy, but they can't hit anything on the shore. Not unless it's perfectly flat or an uphill shot where you can get a clean trajectory. All right, let's take a Cooper count. Whopping 13. And going up. Throw an Atlantis in with that, and you should be good. 
So many strat bombers. He is ground firing the Atlantis. That is being a helpful teammate right there. Taking about a third, not quite half the health off of that. Ground fire is such a useful unit ability. It really, really is. Um, if you look in the bottom left, there will be a... I don't have the user UI, so I can't look at it. Uh, there is a targeting reticule picture. And basically, you click on that, set it to ground fire. Then you press A or select the attack command. And you can place an attack on the ground. And if you have an area of effect weapon, um, ground firing it on an area above submarines, Atlantises, basically anything under the water, you can do a lot of damage. And then if you have a commander under the water and he's not deep enough, or if you have something with huge area of effect, like the Awasa, you can actually ground fire on top of like this pool and the Awasa bomb reaches almost all the way to the bottom. I think it, even if the commander's all the way back there, it still reaches. So that is a handy tactic for ground firing something. Something a lot of people don't realize about this pool. If you're standing in this pool, even if your head is completely underwater, all you have to do is fly one scout over it, see where the blip is, and then send all your strap bombers with the um, ground attack on top of their head and you will kill them. I cannot count the number of times that I have killed someone in that pond that had no idea that you could kill someone under the water with strap bombers. And granted, that's somewhat the player base I play with because I play with like the, I don't know, 800 to 1600 range. And there's a lot of people who don't think about that kind of thing in that range. Um, of course, you're not going to pull someone that off with someone who's a high rank. But it is a handy tactic nonetheless, and sometimes you can sneak up on people if they're just not paying attention. They think, oh, I got my ACU in the water, it's safe. And no, it's actually not. Swarms of T2 torpedo bombers trying their absolute best to eliminate that Atlantis, but it has just enough health, and it is vetting quite nicely to murder all of those torpedo bombers to death. Bashing their faces in and dropping them out of the sky is gonna survive with 6,000 health and live to shred some more. However, there is another wing coming in and I don't know if it has enough to survive this attack. We'll just have to see how well it does. AA reaching out. Cruiser's gonna help out as well. And there's the vet. All right, so it's good. It is going to live and act as its anti-air platform. It's always nice to have a heavy damage unit like this all up on the front because it restricts the movement of the other air player. So, when this game first started, I saw how badly the North was losing Navy, and I really thought that this was going to be a terribly short game. But in reality, the North team is making quite the comeback. It flipped. Southside was behind on air and eco and everything else, and was winning navies, and now the North side is behind on air and winning the navies. So we'll just have to see how this goes. Holy cow, even the front is being run over. That little bit of naval aggression and the bricks coming online has done wonders, but here comes the Awasa in to do all the dirty work. All he has to do is land one bomb right there and he's going to fly over. Don't do it. You gotta drop that bomb. If he would have dropped there, he could have feasibly eliminated the entire T3 group in one shot and would have saved his front player, but I don't think we're quite going to see that. Now, I do admire the tenacity of Urklart for building units all the way up until the end, but there we go, finally getting a brick. When your opponent is going all bricks, you basically have to build bricks because loyalists are not going to compete with bricks. Um, the firing rate and the rotation speed is too high on the bricks. They can kite the Loyalists to death in most cases unless you have an absolute horde, a swarm of Loyalists. There comes the bomb. Kaboom. I do love the Seraphim light effects. The nuke is so cool with that five-pointed star explosion. And then that is just a beautiful thing. That bomb coming in. 
Now, another use of this bomb, as I was mentioning, with the tremendously huge area of effect, you can actually ground fire, like right there, and kill 20 subs. It's awesome. It is totally awesome. And he needs to be doing it, to be honest. Because this navy on the north side, it is holding. It is holding. But it's not looking quite pretty enough. Um, there is some ground firing going on from these battleships, but not much that's effective because the subs are maintaining their moving patterns pretty well. Um, there's a ground fire shot. Boom! You can see ground firing battleships actually does do a lot of good. T2 gunships moving in to finish off those bricks and the south player is going to be safe at least for a little while. Front player that is. Beautiful Awasa drop there, killing off the cruisers that were trying to provide anti-air coverage. Yes, there's two Atlantises still, but they're not going to be able to throw down enough damage in a concentrated manner to drop that Awasa too terribly quickly. Although if it does kind of just sit there lollygagging around, yeah, better move out of there. The accumulated damage is kind of brutal. I'm still thinking he needs to shoot up to the north side and drop a bomb in the middle of all those subs. An air engagement for the masses. Strategic launch. And I detected. see a nuke. All right, I'm gonna stay zoomed out. I'm not gonna go in and pan. I do love this, by the way. We have all of this stuff going on, and I'm only at minus one, which is kind of awesome. We're in the middle of a full-blown air fight here. That was a collision of about 150 to 200 ASF from each side. I imagine as soon as these get eliminated, we will be seeing zeroed out speeds again. Where was that from? Right there. And it is headed probably for the middle of the naval production, and there is no nuke. Well, all of that headway that was made is about to go poof. Because once the production goes offline, you are in a terrible mess. Terrible mess. I have a chicken moving towards the north and still that Awasa on the south side. It looks like we're finally going to get a full naval win on the south side if they can hold out just a little bit more. Twitex out front. He's not going to be in the blast radius of that nuke, but that does mean he loses a large portion of his production. He still has enough where I think he'll be okay, and he's retracting. He just has so many freaking subs. That is 108,000 mass worth of subs, which is just freaking absurd. Let's take a let's take a uh, measure of this. Let's go to Gostronin select his entire navy that is going to be 112,000 mass in the water and this is going to be 118,000 mass in the water so roughly even in terms of mass for mass there's a lot of mass tied up in these battleships which is why the unit count is lower now this is cool this is super cool We've got a drop. Late game. T1 units coming in. Air player is not paying attention. You saw that. It was on radar. Just not picked up. Those are all going to successfully drop. And that's going to knock out a chunk of eco from Twitek. So that means Twitek's lost about a third of his build power. And he's going to lose three mexes. So gradually getting whittled down. Hopefully Ghost Ronin very, very soon will be able to overpower this navy because he really needs to win his side if he doesn't these guys are going to have major major problems here comes another awasa bomb dangerously low health on that awasa it's not going to make it out again unfortunately it is going to drop in the sea nice little chunk of damage on these guys but i don't think it will be enough to actually end this the sub hunter in the back trying to protect those cruisers. Vital resource cruisers don't want to lose them. And there goes the NG drop. Of course, you always want to drop engineers. You have this beautiful sea of mass to reclaim. It's kind of awesome. Finally back up to zero speed. By the way, for those of you who are wondering, rebuilding my PC, I did not actually get a whole new PC 
and this chip at the moment is clocked lower than my old 3570K. I'm actually going to be reseeding the CPU because I screwed up the first time and my temps aren't where I need them to be. And I will be overclocking this and I'll be back up to full speed. Um, I upgraded to a 49, 4790K um, because I needed more threads. And I hope you notice the video is actually a lot smoother. I have noticed a huge difference in gameplay because running the recording programs like I was doing, it was getting a little bit of hitching. And especially towards the late game, I was having some issues with choppiness and the UI not responding and that kind of thing uh, when everything was running. So I have more threads and that means I can process video faster. Um, so that was the main upgrade. Uh, went to an MSI $150 range uh, gaming motherboard and I added two sticks of RAM. I went from eight gigs on two sticks to 16 on four gig, 16 gigs on four sticks in two channels. So four by four memory, um, which is going to help out tremendously on workload tasks. So this is basically a functional upgrade. Same case, uh, same hard drives. Well, actually I do have an additional one terabyte drive, but same basic setup, same graphics card, all that kind of stuff. Just more ability to crunch numbers, not necessarily faster for gaming. All right, so there were enough of these T3 subs to reach a critical mass and break the Coopers. There's still a lot of Coopers alive and there will definitely be some T3 subs that still die, but for the most part, this T3 sub mass has reached the point where it can overpower this UEF Navy. And once he does that, he's going to be able to swarm those battleships and eliminate them in short order. This is a valiant eff effort to stay on track in the south side. These hover tanks are doing a number on these aircraft carriers, but not as quickly as they're vetting. Five stars, five stars, huge reserves of health drawn with a pretty good bit of, uh, regen they will need to either sink or retreat though very quickly because these hover tanks are starting to become a little bit of an issue it looks like media legs is throwing down t2 land factories to help with that hover spam and beat back the navy that is coming up on the shore now this is the beta patch and that's one of the things has been rebalanced is the hover tanks basically they're slower they get a few points knocked off their speed when they're on the water and that has been a very, very nice rebalance. It means that you can still defend your immediate shoreline with hover tanks, but hover tanks are no longer a viable option for completely recovering your navy and then swarming the other side using only hover. You have to have navy, and navy can more easily kite hover to death. I think it was a good, well-balanced change, um, but we're seeing the fact that just because you've got hover in the water doesn't necessarily mean that you're now on track to winning navy and the summits Strategic are dropping launch, left and right we got another nuke coming out we have to see where that sucker's targeted and what sucker is beneath it that would be the more accurate use of that name the amount of damage that t3 subs in a large mass can throw out is truly terrifying it really is. Like, once this size of a group gets rolling, it's kind of hard to stop just because of the distance principle. Because as they're traveling towards you, they're going to come in range first, and this mass coming in range of your units is very, very bad for you. Bad for your health. So, basically, the T3 subs are in to take care of any of the combat units that are still alive, and then these T1 artillery are going to flow in and killed off, kill off the build power which is going to pretty much end any resistance by Ghost Ronin. Ghost Ronin has by far the biggest eco, but he's not going to be able to actually use it since he's losing his navy, and that was a nice nuke. Four T3 mechs going down. A lot of build power lost. Definitely not a game ender, but it is going to help his situation a lot, or at least it would if not for the fact that his position was already completely eliminated. He is going to get killed off by those T3 subs. He stayed out in the water a little bit too long. I'm not sure if that was a suicide or if he legit got caught out, but either way, he 
he is toasty fried, which means his eco is going to be given over to Carisi. Not sure if Carisi is totally up to that. He's kind of got his hands full on this side, dealing with hover tanks that are rolling into his base. But hopefully he will do the best that he can. It looks like he's going to pick up those Percy's and fly them over to this side. That was actually a nice touch. I like that. Um, T3 transports and loading up the Percival's. Maybe he'll still be able to produce with that. He needs to be getting Titans online or Pillars. Titans would actually be kind of cool because he could roll out and eliminate these T1 artillery that are casually flowing into his base and will soon be eliminating build power. I think I've said eliminated about five or six times this cast. Apparently that's the word of the day. Eliminate. I would sing a song about it, but I'm really not that enthused at the moment. So much reclaim to be had out in this field. What, we, what was the count? Seven summits? Six summits. There were at least six. There are three out in this water, and there's becoming such an air presence that uh, torp bombers are no longer an option. You got the bulwarks, which are going to prevent DPS from reaching the target, and then you've got all of these cruisers that are going to kill 100% of the torp bombers on the first pass. So basically, this navy is now airproof. If they can make themselves hoverproof, then the fight is won. So a nice little mix of Titans, Flak, and Percivals. Not sure where that's actually dropping. It looks like it's going on the island. Nicely planned. It's going to eliminate that eco. Honestly, there are better places that it could be put. But with the air presence, you want to drop them at the first available location and not risk losing them on a distance drop. Engineers are plenty coming through, and the last naval factories are going down on the north side. I think this may finally be the fold of the southern team. Not really seeing a comeback. Likely, looks like Urklart is still using his resource allocation upgrade, so Telemazer is not an option unless he gets a boost from the air player to do it. But his air player is already severely power stalled. Pro tip. If you do not have the power to run them, it is actually wasted mass to build all of these freaking fabricators because when they're turned off, they're not producing. So not a whole lot of point in overbuilding all of those. Need to throw down some more power generators, ASAP. Of course, this is also a power draw. Building that Awasa with that much build power takes quite a bit. Not sure what the Awasa is really going to accomplish though. Even if he ground fires this Navy to death, there's not really a recovery option. If he sends it up the middle, there's enough air from the combined air players. Yeah, to deny it. And then he's got anti-air emplacements over a lot of the map. So I don't really see a way out of it for these guys. It's kind of sad, but it is a reality. I think we're about to see a wrap on this game. So a little bit of a fight going down on the front side. Megalith exchanging blows with a huge group of... Holy cow. <laughs> Thanks to the extra damage laid down by that summit and those bricks, the Monkey Lord is actually going to survive. When was the last time you saw a Monkey Lord survive versus a Megalith? That just doesn't happen. The carnage that can be dished out by a group of Zooies is awesome. Again, I don't think they're overpowered. They're within the damage range of the other artillery. They cost 50% more. Basically, you're paying half again as much mass for the ability to hover, and they have a decent mix of the firing rate and spread pattern of the Aeon and UEF T1 artillery. It falls right in between the two. See, Mega going south Navy. That would be this Megalith. Which means that hopefully we will see a wrap on this. I don't know. Let's check to see if we got any game enders going. The Awasa looks like about the only option at the moment. Got lots of power going down. Got all this other stuff built. Not anything happening over there. 
not anything happening over here. Overall, it does not look like there's any late game options to be had. Up on this side, we are seeing a salvation. Hot diggity dog. And we'll see a T3, technically T3, but essentially T4 artillery piece coming online. I don't know why it's on the T3 tier, to be honest. The salvation is at least on par with the Mavor, even though it doesn't have quite as much range. And by quite as much, I mean half. Has a huge range, but not huge enough to reach the entire map on all maps. But I don't think the range ring is even visible on settings. That is 85% complete. So we may see it come online. I imagine once those shots start coming out, we're probably going to see some rage quits. Monkey Lord away! And apparently someone is... <laughs> That's great. Someone's an LOTR fan. We got Bilbo Baggins and Boromir. Those guys are blue. Let's find some other SACUs from blue. Are there any? We'll look in a minute. Alright, one megalith is down. That was, I believe, a... F oh, no, that was the other players. Okay. Second megalith taking fire with bricks coming in from the side. I'm not sure that these guys will survive, but maybe we'll see some good overcharges from these SACUs. That could be the redeeming factor in this fight. I think, yeah. They're definitely going to win it. Two overcharges totaling out to 24,000 damage. We see another pair of overcharges. That thing is dead. There it is. Kaboom. Ah, maybe it's not 12,000. Did they decrease the damage on the SACU overcharge? That's weird. Or maybe it was a well-timed... It's probably a well-timed vet from that killing the Monkey Lord. All right, so front is held at least, and that prevents the Megalith from going southward. So all is not totally lost, but it's pretty dang close. Hover tanks moving in. What kind of sucks about this situation is the fact that UEF does not have hover flak. So once the tanks get out from under the cover of the cruisers, then they're pretty much completely susceptible to gunships. And we all know that broadswords deal out a ton of damage. Basically evaporating those tanks from the face of the water as soon as they connect. And here comes the low sim speeds again. Yay! Minus two, because we got an air fight. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to break my computer apart tonight and overclock it because I'm not used to this. Actually, I was very impressed. The stock clock on a 4790 is like 4.4 which is awesome I think my yeah my 3570k was stable at 4.6 but if I can get my cooler seated correctly I can easily get 4.6 out of this chip um, and stay well within the 60 degree range possibly even a little higher I'm just gonna have to play with it the cruiser fire is real <laughs> Clumps of cruisers are just about the worst thing for your health as an air unit, and I don't know why this is happening unless he just gave up. Eider is saying he's in big trouble. Well, not really. Yeah. Oh, it's dead. Surprise! <laughs> Summit fire and a couple of bricks were all it took. But there is another monkey lord headed up. We have to see how that fares. We're trying to lay down some SAMs out front to help provide some air denial. But cruisers and battleships are immediately going to come in and squash those dreams. Harm taking out that uh, cruiser. That's amazing that thing is still alive. Is it even on a radar? Yes, it is. Should have killed that thing a long time ago. Again, ground fire. Cruisers and battleships can kill those. Take a look at our handy dandy salvation up on the north side. 
just in time to see it come online. Bam! That means we're about to see some motion and it is going to begin firing. Something that was brought up by the balance discussion group that I had not thought about before but is actually totally true. Um, the rotation time of T3 and T4 artillery. Because if you have an artillery built on the north side of the map, the artillery builds with the gun facing down. And that means that it barely has to rotate to begin firing. Whereas if you're on the south side, the gun is facing in the opposite direction of the enemies that you need to shoot at. Which means that you lose like 45 seconds of time after the thing is built to the gun turning. So if two people complete a salvation at the same time, the north one will always win because the rotation is lower. And uh, it's not totally broken, and that very, very rarely happens. But it's a thing that we all need to be aware of. Well, hello there. Bit of damage. I think that was strictly the battleship. And here comes our first round of fire from that artillery. Salvations are so cool to watch. It starts out as one shot, and then it splits once and splits a second time and impacts and the area of effect is just so so huge to be realistic about it and holy crap that was a bad voice break I'm gonna grab a uh, drink of water I actually took my own advice this time this is a long cast so having that glass of water on hand is a good thing um, the salvation should not be targeted at single buildings. Um, now you can use it for taking out nuke defense and it will eventually kill the nuke defense but the firing spread is so big on it that it completely and totally sucks at hitting single buildings slash small targets. It is brilliant however at killing off shields at killing off build power because if you target the factory it's going to eliminate all of the engineers around it and uh, at killing off bases like this. So you want to choose your targets where you have clumps of units so that you can get the maximum effectiveness out of your artillery. Got a final push up the middle here. Bilbo Baggins and Baromir are trekking towards the north. There is still a practically full health megalith online and these guys are gonna lose a lot of health to this lightning storm and the battleships. Unfortunately, having to walk by all of those summits is a death warrant. It was a noble effort. I appreciate the bravery, but realistically speaking, that was not a good idea. Not going to provide a success story. And the carnage continues, raining down from that rapid fire artillery. Picking his targets very well, actually. Uh, he's got the power going down. It looks like that is the central point of this spread. If I were him, I would probably kill that, and then I would go for this back here, because that's going to be easy pickups on kills. Impacting the energy storage for that 1k damage explosion. And there is... I think that was a quit. Could have been strap bombers. May theoretically have missed that. Or battleships. Probably battleships. I think it's battleships. I am not going to fast forward through this entire replay to, um, ah, control K confirmed. Because it would take me an hour to get back to this spot. Ah, no, not the desync. You know what? I actually, I think I talked to this person and I think they did say that it turned out the same way. Maybe it did. I think we can safely say who won. I'm going to leave it up. We're going to watch what happens. Maybe it's desynced, maybe it's not. But uh, yeah, not a whole lot to be done at this point. Solid win for the north side. I had a fun time with the beginning of this game was pretty freaking hysterical The all the little drops and activity going on around the edges of the map had a close escape on the north side for the front player all that good stuff but uh, 
towards the end. And there was a complete shift in who it looked like was winning, but this is a pretty solid win by the north side. Oh, what have we here? Well, that's interesting. I don't think it's enough, though. I really don't think it's enough. Here comes ASF going after that transport. Is he going to drop? That is the question. He's going to fly over a naval factory, so we know for sure that it's been spotted. And there's the impact. We got ASF and boom. <laughs> Beautiful five-pointed star. Seraphim explosion. And that is it. All earthly possessions go to Carisi. He was going to bravely try to get a tax snipe online, but even if he eliminates that, I don't think it's going to make any difference at this point. Because the damage is so heavy to all of this stuff back here. And there's that shot landing like I was talking about. Kaboom! There goes all that ringed uh, energy storage. Or not energy storage, fabricators. That's why you really don't want to ring them. Sometimes the adjacency bonus is not worth the extra threat from those explosions. <laughs> Mega production line is right. It's got these things rolling out. And a bit of hover moving in. Oh no! No! ACU standing in the middle of power generators and energy storage. I know that happened because uh, Newbie is commenting LOL. Yeah, that was LOL. That was fantastic. <laughs> that is the worst way to die. When you're standing in the middle of a ton of explosive buildings and that one shot, one shot is all it takes and the accumulated damage of everything all put together just wipes you from the face of the earth. Awesome stuff. All right, well played by the north side. Ended up with all four players still alive. Miracle of miracles. And uh, the entire south team eliminated. So winners, winners. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for me for this cast. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And like I said, I will be fine-tuning my settings to get back on track with the casting. And then also, um, guys who had messaged me about Patreon, please email me back at the email address in the description with those replay IDs and your player name. So I have that attached to it, and I will get those casts out as quick as I possibly can. And if anybody else would like a cast done for you, that is a Patreon reward. Or if you just feel like supporting the channel, by all means, click away on that Patreon link. And I greatly appreciate any support that you guys feel like giving. Alrighty, that's going to wrap it up for me. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next cast.